Hello. I was on Zoom like last class, so I didn't get my test paper. So oh, um, I think he will bring them today. Also, I don't have them with me. Okay. Or he has them with him. Um, so I can. Uh, when can I get that paper? Today. Uh, hopefully, like, it's not with me. Party oh, no. should bring that today in class. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Are you Helena? Are you Helena? Is your name Helena? No. Hmm? Angela. Angela. Okay. Sure. Hello.
according to the clock, it's time for class to be I have an announcement. I came to my office on Tuesday with this magazine. said that you could tell me to So Does not. Does not work. It works on my I used to have some disdain for Apple. Now I have an app for Apple. They actually changed the UI for their own windowing software so that. It No longer exists, and done in Java needs to load the class corresponding to a type doesn't exist. That should be the best trace map that says class type. And um, okay, so okay, so at any rate, what I what so the just how does this affect you? Well, when you go back to what you have to do on the back is you have to control job. That means you're responsible for all the automatic stuff that the translator from functional Java to whole Java does. Okay? Which, if you notice when I was using my slides, it would be a different color for some of the code that is the code we have right? whole Java. So, for example, in fact, I can summarize this is very logical. Functional Java since every flash you define in Java is a data representation. Okay, so what it's going to do essentially is you declare a class that has a collection of fields, and Dr. Java is going to set up the class definition so it's roughly corresponds to a defined struct in a bracket with exactly the same successor. Okay, and so it has to auto generate those, it has to auto generate the constructor, which is based on argument per field. It also has to auto generate structural equality, because that's the notion of equality. And then there are a couple of different networks in the home and job and over by the future. Well, we don't use hash codes. None of the things we use are hash codes, so we need to hash codes. The other thing that the final thing that's done by functional Java is it gives you a straight method to print out the same data classes that are received. And in many cases, you don't need that. You know, it sort of depends. If you want to write a unit test where you compare the level of strings, you need it, right? Because you need a straight method that's going to output whatever uh, functional object you created with everything that we constructed. You know, nice to print that out because you want to be able to generate, you want to be able to check what's being returned against 
what uh, you claim the answer is, and you're thinking the level of structure is wrong. If you use the LC square, this is the level of what address is. So I don't think you notice this when you say a certain equals in J unit. There are a number of different definitions of a certain equal with different signatures in the case of library. And there's one for string string, and there's another different codex used for string string, and the codex is used for um, whatever it types of case of equals in list or, or list of table key phrases, twist and generic version. And so in the end, it turns out that for a lot of things, if you have enough parsing, it's pretty good. It's easy to see those things. But it's a little bit dangerous because it's not the same as structural quality, it's just saying it's a string output is too many. And if you aren't really careful about how the string is defined, you might actually take things that are structurally different. As a trivial example, you can say, well, the string always always prints blue, no matter what. But then you can call it a sure the string on uh, the, the thing you computed the over hand list or whatever makes it blue. And your uh, answer when you fill up the constant or whatever in the test case, and then you say, okay, what is this string? What's blue again? So blue is equal to blue, but it doesn't matter the actual structural representation. So uh, anyway, the way Dr. Java functional language level works is he's printing out exactly what you have to write to construct the output you can do except the means of the But if you've been reading the description notes, you know what you can put it every time if you're actually building these that say do is done. Right? But when you're printing that thing out, those are kind of kind of things that just don't cause it to work. Does that make sense to you? In fact, to the extent those of you who have played with the Dr. Jockey got the Windows machine. Oh, by the way, and on Windows, when I was doing development, so I did a solution. By the way, the extra credit version of Line 7. It, it, not the sense that it was conceptually difficult, fighting with the silliness of Java type system. In fact, I wanted, I wanted a solution where I had no more details. And the only thing you, you've heard me talk about the case, which is a huge, you know, it's kind of like it's a good thing I wasn't on staff at Sun or you know, because they finally kind of incredibly noise legit in person. Because of the, the, you know, I'm screaming about the fundamental mistakes of the thing. But ever since Java first came out, when you do an instance of tests on the value of some expression, and usually it's a good. Then you reference that variable in the control path following a successful instance of it. So you absolutely know it's a, it, it, it belongs to that type, right? It does not. Type checking system just ignores the fact that there was a there. And so you have to explicitly pass it to the type that you just checked in the instance of it. Otherwise, your program will not comply. So those are unavoidable to write code in Java. You can have those tasks. But the goal when you write good Java code, you can sit there, you'd like to have the code compiled with no more than this. And you'd like the only tasks that you've inserted to be those that correspond to topologies that you don't talk from your pieces of it. Now it turns out it's impossible to do it. And you end up having to put in tasks, for example, a specific instantiation of the node type, like list of images. You might have to pass a list of images. John, it erases all the parametric type information in the actual code. So it cannot implement this. So what does it do? It does nothing. It's a no, except the type check. It sees the type check. Oh yeah. Probably just the information. But there's nothing executed. And so it generates a warning, saying, "Well, you know, you have this operation here, and we actually can't guarantee it. I can search." 
that's the real world. So what do you do in real world software? Does anybody ever use the ampersand suppress warnings annotation? You put that in front, right? And that's a horrible hack. But Java is horrible. Okay, at that at that level. Now, anyway, I used to give examples for Java, but that was 20 years ago. Uh, we've gone beyond it. I just had that conversation with Joel. Didn't I know John was the deputy for this competition in two years ago? And he knows a lot about uh, Kotlin, and he was telling me more about Kotlin. I, I was impressed. So the future, and that may be a better path to it, uh, because they have a native protein file. I worry about. We generate Android native code, and I'm worried if there's anything else that's going to be platforming that have a But anyway, so if you have issues, you had issues with the back, okay, just do the whole job and you use Java 17. Just make sure you're not doing anything funny that is bad to Java 8. So Java 8 is a huge language. You have to be hard to write to find something. You, you look for it, you can find it. Did you hear in this position? Okay, yeah. how hard would be would it be to uh, use Dr. Java on the Windows computers on campus, like on the library or? Yeah, you can do that. Too. You can do that. Easy. By the way, the Oracle JVM, my major doctor down there is as follows: the J, the Pareto JVM is really and I think it's all because of the issue of conference. Java has poor support for writing applications that use conference. It's an explicit line. Okay, and this is, this is the major is the schedule, it's scheduling all the tasks that are runnable, right? They're not, they're not blocked. And those schedulers vary from one platform to another. So you're trying to write a portable application, you can get it running perfectly on the platform that you're using, and it may not work on other platforms. In the early days of Java development, we had people sitting at masks, people sitting at input machines, and also people running over on, on for writing communities. And we generally try to make sure that our system works well across all of those things. And we would have situations where we had a concurrence as well on one platform and not on another. And what, what's going on in concurrence is the public gets on the switch. And we have a platform that has a network that has certain biases. It'll never go into a certain territory of the schedule. And that may be the only place to punch your phone. And so when you're testing complex software, it's a nightmare because you really need to be testing against all possible schedules. The number of possibilities you've got to check there is the key to the to look at it, there's no way that can come back. So beware. And uh, they're, they're, you, want, you really would like something much more abstract and, and less terrifying than the interface. Java, and I think Java has actually does a little better than Swing. That's about it. Let's go on and talk about modern stuff. All right. So last time we were. Uh, last time, one of the things that I wanted to show you guys, but I couldn't remember how to do it, is how to enable compiler warnings. So I uh, looked up how to do that. You basically put this flag on top of your file. So that's usually a good thing to have compiler warnings. So here, what happened is, um, let's see. So it it loaded, but then it is giving me a warning that I did not add a type signature. And also that I have used X over here, but I have bound this variable to X, but I have not used it. So if I wanted to suppress this warning, I could just say this. And this is usually more often a good thing than not, because uh, you, if you have forgotten, you, if you have bound this X and have forgotten to use it for some reason, it would tell you that you have forgotten. Okay. So the last thing we talked about last time was the last thing we were talking about in the last class was composition. And if, and uh, there were two interesting functions 
which are polymorphic and very useful for us is application and composition. So I talked a little bit about application and usually if you remember this, it's used in the form of dollar. So notice one thing that um, if I uh, want to have So if I wanted to have something like, uh, I want to apply, let's say this function fib to, uh, to 10, I can write it like that. But um, although when I want to use it, like ask the type checker about it, I'm putting this parenthesis over here. So these kinds of functions, which like, which are, uh, which can be used in infix notation if you want to use them in post in prefix notation for some reason uh, you can put this parents over here and uh, that's how you do it so uh, conversely there is another notation which is used sometimes which is the back tick notation let me show you so remember from last lecture we defined this my max function so the way to use it would be to use something like that. But uh, for some reason, if you wanted to use it in the infix notation, you put back ticks like that. And uh, there you have it. So if you put back ticks, you can also partially apply it. This basically is saying, if you do this, this is basically saying that the second argument of this thing is uh, three and the first argument has not yet been specified. It, it's just like saying uh, what is the type of division by 10. Uh, so if I have this, remember from last class that like all these functions are carried and like they can be partially applied in this manner. So if I apply this, this is like that. So just like that, you can also fix the second argument of a function that takes two arguments by using this back tick notation and parents. It's uh, just useful sometimes because you will see this kind of notation often. So yeah, let's get back to composition. So uh, last time we were looking at, uh, do I have, yeah, we were looking at something like this and I suggested that a nicer way to write this with like lesser brackets is to use dollars. But uh, often sometimes what is done is we use composition as well. So we could write it like that. So how to read this thing is basically that first I compose this function with that function and then I apply that to the result. So basically what is happening over here is given any argument, I'm first doubling it and then adding 10 to it. This is the composition of these two functions. And then I'm applying this composition to this. So this, uh, you would be seeing this composition operator pretty often. Um, so any questions about any of this stuff? Is the meaning of composition clear to everyone? Okay, that's good. So let's get to some new stuff. So uh, today we will talk about lists. So we define lists like this, uh, not exactly define. I mean, like the notation for lists is like that. You basically have brackets and you put the stuff inside and then you have the empty list, which is like that. So uh, as before lists are either empty or cons of something, these are like functional lists, like you have implemented in Dr. Java or racket before that. So that's what is happening here. And you can also ask type of this. Um, so maybe this is not a good example right now, but um, so the type of that is something like this. Um, let me turn off the code completion. So here notice that like uh, this is a new kind of type which we have not seen before and it also 
it not only tells you that this is a list, but it also tells you that there is what kind of list it is. And um, we will be using lists pretty frequently, like when we use Haskell. They may not be efficient sometimes, but they are pretty simple to use. So unless efficiency is a big concern, we will use lists uh, in really lots of places. So what are some important functions which we define on lists? Uh, anybody has any suggestions? Hmm? Length, yeah. So let's, so let's see what is the type of length. Yes. You may want to talk a little louder. I'm not sure. Talk a little louder. Talk a little louder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, and I should also probably increase my font size. I hope this is better. Uh, please let me know if you can't hear me. I'm sorry. So um, let's ignore this uh, definition of length for now. It's a bit general but uh, let's define our version of length. So let's uh, do a simple version first. So let's say I have a list of integers and I want to figure out its length. And how would I do that? In, in racket, what I would do is I would pattern match on the, I, I would do cond and then ask whether the list is empty or not. And then I would, uh, if the list is non-empty, then I would take the length of the list length of the rest of the list and add one to that. So we do that here by pattern matching. So this, this pattern matches the empty list. And the pattern match for cons is written like that. So the, we call the first element X and the rest of the element X is. So I, if I understand correctly, this is the plural of X or something, but this is just notation that's used in the community. It's not particularly great. So in this case, this would just be one plus XS. So let's compile that. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So Notice that the type checker is complaining. I tried to do one plus XS, but that doesn't make sense because I should take the length of XS. XS is a list, so I can't add one to it. So this is like really the benefit of the type checker. When you say something nonsensical, nonsensical it shouts at you. So here I'm supposed to say length of XS. Yes? Yes. So yeah, that works, except the compiler is uh, shouting at us again because we don't use this argument, but that's fine. We can just replace that with that uh, and that should work. So one thing we should change about this, what, what is something we can change about this code? We are making this function overly specific for no reason because uh, it doesn't really have to be. So any suggestions on what this type should be instead? Yes. In fact, if we ask the compiler, it should tell us that. Uh, it. Well, it says that this is a general number because I have put one and it could be a, some other kind of number than integer, but yeah, it's, it suggests that like uh, this thing could just be a instead of integers because there is no reason we have to restrict our restrict ourselves to uh, lists of type in. So well, that's good. Um, so I, I maybe we don't use this fun we have not used this functions enough, but um, we probably should. So there are two examples of functions which are like super useful. One is math and another is filter. Well, there is also fold, we will come to that. So does anyone know what map does? Someone wants to volunteer and say what map does on, on list. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So let's apply.
this function and this is a function which adds two two things so i can do this right so this is one place where uh, this kind of parity notation is very useful because i just had to put um only one of the uh only one of the arguments and it can figure out that the other argument is where the function needs to be applied so for example uh, i can also use this flip function from last time uh okay never mind Mm. so uh let's figure out how to write the definition for map so for empty lists we just output the empty list otherwise what do we do yes so i uh okay so there should be a uh, function over here and in the other case what we do is that so it complains because there is already a map in the standard library yeah and the type of this is what so let's use our uh, knowledge about types from the last lecture w how should we type this function first yeah so first we want to type if so what type should we give a, give if let's give it some type a or b and then it we should take some list what should we want the type of that list to be yes and then ultimately we get a list of it. and that should type check fine it does type check fine um there is also a function called filter and what does filter do yes so filter filter takes in a predicate i call this kind of function a predicate because it like returns a boolean value and it takes a list and it said it gives me only all those lists which satisfy the predicate only all those elements of the list which satisfies the predicate so for example uh, i have this list which uh okay let's make a list and then i want to filter only all those elements which are less than 10 and that's how this works by the way one useful thing to know about this list is this notation if you do this it gives you a list of elements from this value to this value and you can slightly change this like that so yeah, this is very useful so um let's define my filter so how can we define filter so first let's put the type so how can we define the filter function somebody please volunteer yes so if it's empty it's empty well we need a function in for the first case it doesn't matter for the second case uh, let's call that function p actually for the second case we need to case split 
and then we uh, we are going to use guards over here remember guards from last lecture so if px so i could say px equal to equal to true but that's not necessary it's just px if this is true then um we want to have p around and then we do my filter p of x is and if p of x is not true then we just do this why is it uh, so yeah it complains because in it says in the second argument of if what have i put like on this side i have put a list but on this or on this side i have a put a list of is but on this side i have put a function which is of type this so this is not type a so that's bad right because i should be putting x over here so that's a good thing we like i made this error and the compiler caught that for me so these uh, type errors are annoying in the beginning but they are actually very helpful they have they reduce uh, your actual runtime errors by a huge amount mm. yes so in that pattern batch, yes, the uh, parser is got to infer that p space x means p applied to x, not tag p. Uh, oh, so this is like, like yes. Think about, like, Let me answer that question. Yeah. So here, like what I'm doing, this is like pattern matching, but these are guards. So here it is expecting a boolean value. So you can't do a pattern match over here. This is expecting a uh, Boolean okay. value. So it's, the, the vertical bar is not the pattern match. Well, yeah. So this vertical bar is called a guard. So after a guard, it doesn't expect a pattern. It expects a expects a Boolean value. You know, who, as far as I know, the benefit of guard is Dijkstra. Kind of interesting. Move on in that limited way. I see. You would be. He doesn't talk. That's all, all yeah. So, so we have defined map filter. Uh, there are a couple of other useful, very useful tools with um, lists, which I will show you, but I will not define. You can try to do this at home yourself. So there is take. So take takes the first few elements. So I could do take two and it does that. There is drop, which is the opposite of that. And then there is length, which we did actually. There is indexing. So I could have a list of numbers from one to 10. If I want the fourth number, I mean, it starts counting from zero really. So it will give you, give me five. This function is not, I call this function partial because it can sometimes give you an error. So for example, it says that the index is too large. Mm. There is another function, which is very useful, which is called zip, uh, zip. Actually, uh, so zip takes two lists like that and it combines them. Sometimes this is very useful. Um, so it does that. Well, in this case, like the second second list had like too many uh, too many extra elements. We just ignore them. And then there is also zip width, which takes in an extra function and it basically like ties each pair with that function. So it's like, if you apply plus to each of these, you get like the thing over here. Um, anyway, so all of these are very really useful functions. I would encourage you guys to try implementing them yourselves. So uh, let's look at list comprehensions now. So let's say I want uh, Tri triples of elements. So let's 
let me give this that type so notice the nested kind of things over here so first of all there are ints over here so this is three ints at a time so this is a tuple of ints a three tuple of ints and i have a list of loops so i am going to define triangles like this uh, So this is a list comprehension notation. And what it does is it like enumerates all such pairs. So actually uh, we can, uh, we can write all of these notations of list comprehension in terms of simpler functions like map and uh, filter and all that. So maybe we will get back to that later sometime. But let me continue with this demonstration. We can add uh, we can add extra clauses to this list comprehension. For example, I could say that I only want all those tuples where uh, actually let me. So notice that adding this thing could have could just have been done by putting a filter over here. I could have. Uh, so actually, let me do it that way. So let if I wanted to do it that way, I would do filter triangles. Actually, the uh, function goes first. So the function for the function, I want to take in a take in three elements, and let's give those. This is a lambda notation, by the way. If you remember from last time. So I'm going to give these three elements, uh, three names, call them A, B, and C. And then I'm going to check if A star A plus B star B is equal to, equal to C star C. So notice that we are doing pattern matching inside the uh, Lambda. And yeah, it gives me the exact same result, which is good. Mm. So yeah, as I said before, all of these uh, list comprehensions can be desugared into like using filter and map and those things. So we will do that at some point. Uh, so in the exam, one of the problems we had was scalar product or so let us try to do that problem in two ways. So one way to do this would be to do something like this. This is the accumulator version. Well, something like that. But uh, as we will see, like with the tools that we have already seen, there is a better way to define this. So this is like a help function. Uh, in Haskell, in the Haskell community, Haskell programmers often call this help function Go, but you can call it whatever you want. So what is what this is doing is that go is take so this xs and ys these are taking two uh, these are two lists of numbers and then we are going to output a number so um, we should of course like first type this uh, what type should we give to this hmm? I can't hear you but I think you are saying this. So maybe we, we could have gone with int or something. Actually, there is a better way to like, instead of using particularly float or int or something, there is a better way. We will talk about that later. So let's say that I have a float of, I have a list of numbers, another list of numbers, and then I'm going to consider their dot product and scalar product and get another number. So I'm going to use this uh, help function go and if either of the lists are empty, then I can just produce the accumulator. Actually, let me call this variable accumulator because suggestive names are good. Uh, so 
so notice that the way that we are writing this function does not guarantee that like does not check that both lists are equal size if one of the lists is shorter then it just ignores the extra elements so what is the last case the last case is something like this so i have this accumulator and to this accumulator i add x times y and then i make a recursive call hopefully that works uh, what is the problem oh this is fine actually it's saying that i when i call this particular thing xs i am forgetting about this xs which is true but it's not a big deal like maybe i should just turn off the compiler warnings so i will call this left left and right now one so now it's saying that we were giving so yeah okay it it gave me suggestions to clean up my code but like it, it didn't claim that like there were any errors so that's good so we can use this function like that something like that mm. i i can't do the calculation in my head but you can check try to check so um this is one way to do it like given any particular list function you can always try to uh, do that function by doing some kind of pattern matching and help functions and all that but uh, most of the time it's a better idea to use existing functions to so that your code is more readable so let us do it in another way so i'm going to call this scalar product prime and let's call the lists l and r as before so remember the function zip from 5 minutes ago so what zip does is it combines two lists so that is exactly uh, what we want to do here right we want to take l and r and we want to zip them well if i zip them then i get so let let's try to do an example so if i if i have 1, 2 and let's say 2, 3 after the, after zipping them i would get 1, uh, actually let me pick other numbers 3 and 4 so after zipping them i would get something like this so after i do the zip this is not yet enough so i'm putting this dollar here because i will do something else now what i what i should do on each of these things is i will do a map and i will take each of these two elements like one from the left and one from the right and then i will just multiply them together so in our working example what happens is that the first element so this thing becomes 2 and the second thing becomes 12 and uh, there is a built in function called sum so uh, ignore that ignore that for for now but there is a built in function called sum which takes in a list of elements and produces its sum so it in this case it would just produce for me so we can okay that's good and we can try to check if these results are the same that's good uh, any question yeah yeah you were right this should be 1 and 3 and 2 and 4 you were right thanks and uh, 3 and 8 And eleven, we can actually check that. Yeah, thank you. So, any other questions? So, yeah, uh, try to remember like have these functions around there pretty useful. so another thing which we talked about before was zip width and 
the example that we saw with zip width was something like this, which combines something. So actually, if we knew about zip width, we could just replace this particular map with zip width star, and it should still work. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um. So let us write a sorting algorithm. I will do this with quick sort because uh, maybe later we can do my sort also. So I will take a list of elements. Let's call that integers for now. And if it is uh, empty, then I just produce the empty list. If it is non-empty, then um, I'm going to consider all the elements which are less than x. Let's call them lesser for now. We will give them a de data definition later. And in the middle, I will put the put x, and then I will put the rest of the elements. So what we're going to do now, of course, is to use this where notation, and we're going to define this like we said. And here I can use a list comprehension or I could just use filter. So I'm going to do this. So it's not YS, it's XS because I want to take the elements from this list. And that. And so this is what problems do we have? Oh, so it is complaining because over here I gave it a wrong type because it's not producing a single integer, but uh, List of integers. Hmm? Yes, actually, that is something we will talk about later because we can't apply it to say uh, booleans because I mean, unless we declare that false is less than true, then it doesn't make sense. So we need to be a little more careful. We will talk about that. That's a very interesting point. over here so this pivot element like i'm i'm always choosing the first element as the pivot element yes that's a great point thanks i forgot that so yeah um So yeah, the quick sort didn't work. I got this. So yeah, like you suggested, I forgot to do quick sort in here. So your yeah, types will not always save you. Sorry. So now it should work, yeah. So for several reasons, this is not necessarily the best implementation because for example, this concatenation takes linear time. So you have to go over this lesser to put this x over here and then you have to go over the whole thing to put greater um, the other reason this is not such a great algorithm is because or not such a great implementation is because the way i have written lesser and greater i have to traverse over the list twice um, we could fix that but uh, i think we should talk about something else now so, and then maybe uh, as an exercise, you could try writing March sort. That would be a little more uh, functional and also efficient. So let's talk about uh, something else. So I want to define this function. 
and I'm going to call it my mult. And it is a kind of multiplication function. And let's define it like. So yeah, it is the compiler is giving me some warnings. Let's ignore that for now. But let us consider this definition and then let's try to uh, apply it on. So consider this. In If I have something like that, Okay, I, I was hoping that it would give me an error. But my point is that even though, hmm, can I make it given? Uh, yeah, for some reason, I can't make it give an error, but consider like let's pretend that it was an error so consider this expression uh, so would this expression give me zero or would it return an error and for haskell the answer is that it would give me as give me a zero and this is what is known as laziness so if i had this function and i uh, try to apply this definition on this function. I would just notice that the first argument is zero and then I would just return zero and I would not try to evaluate whatever this is. And then I would, uh, just happily return zero without noticing that there is an error here. I mean, um, I could make this an error like, hopefully, yeah. So, and if I had this, like that would blow up but it gives me an exception, but since, or if I have this in the first argument, notice that like for, if I put this error in the second argument, it gives me, and this first argument is zero, it's perfectly fine. But if I put this error in the first argument, that is not going to be okay because it has to, for the first argument, we have to ask the question whether it is zero or not. So the point is that Haskell will only evaluate something when it needs to. Mm. So anybody has any questions about this so far? So uh, in some cases, this kind of evaluation strategy is very useful. One of my favorite examples is having lazy lists. So remember that we had this notation which said that go take numbers from one to ten. Yes. Right. I put the error second argument. Yes. So um, yeah. So uh, this function is not necessarily strict on the first argument. Like I said, uh, not necessarily strict on the second argument because it may not need to know what is the value of the second argument, but this is not commutative in the sense that uh, it does need to know the first argument. Actually, maybe a better example of this would be the AND function. Uh, 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 yeah, I can't think of a good example right now. Um, hmm? yeah, yeah, I mean, we could have said that, but like the def this definition doesn't say that. So I, the point is that like, uh, in some cases, like some functions may be strict on one argument, but not the other. Yes. 
they do have to be the right type yes so actually this yes so actually even before haskell tries to run anything it always type checks so if i did like something like that is like a type error so this is a type error it says that i expect an int but you give me a character so uh, haskell always tries to run the type checker first and see if there are any type errors but uh, these errors that we are talking about those are runtime errors so actually interestingly if you look at the type of this function called error like i had this function over here which was producing this error this function error takes a string and it produces some kind of thing of any type which is why this always type checks so this error function is kind of mysterious and it basically the idea is that you can put the error function anywhere and it makes sense so yeah lazy lists so remember that this was the list of numbers from 1 to 10 but i can have this kind of list also and it keep just keeps going so the point is that how can this be useful and uh, of course it can be because we don't really need to produce the list all the way before to know the answer to some computation for example if i have take three and then i apply that on this list i don't have to put the dollar really so in this case even though this list in list is infinite i need to know only the first three elements of it and uh, this works perfectly fine it doesn't need to compute the whole list or anything like that mm -hmm. so here is a rather interesting example so i will define the list of primes and this list is going to be an infinite list and this technique is called the sieve of eratosthenes i don't know how to pronounce that so what i'm going to do is i'm going to start with 2 and i'm going to apply this function called filter prime on it and the definition of filter prime is going to be as follows so given a given a list of elements so this list is more like a stream because it's going to be infinite it's going to well let's call this p because the first thing that has not been filtered out we know that to be prime so we are going to produce this p in the front and then we are going to uh we are going to take this element xs and then we are going to uh consider all elements of xs which are not divisible by this prime and we are going to take that list and on that list we are going to apply filter prime again so whatever is the first element of this list that is going to be also a prime and then its multiples are going to be filtered out and so on so this is a list which contains all primes so it tells me that this is this is um non exhaustive but it doesn't matter because we know that this list is going to be non empty so in this case the compiler has like less information than us i mean we can put an extra case saying that it's not an error though it's just a warning i mean this so we can do mm -hmm. so there are some other functions which are very useful when it comes to lazy when it comes to this kind of infinite lists one is called repeat so what repeat does is it takes something and it produces that uh infinitely 
and then there is iterate iterate takes a function and it applies that again and again so i could it add 10 i could start with one and keep adding 10 so like all of these things are in increments of 10 we can see that by looking at the first 10 elements. right um actually let me give me uh, give you another interesting example of uh, using iterate in a rather nice way so I i'm going to define this fibonacci function one more time and remember that in the fibonacci function how this works ultimately when it comes down to the okay this is not the most efficient version but the uh, linear version so you take some elements take two elements old and new and what happens is that the new element becomes old um and what we what then current new element becomes is new plus old so if you have written the tail recursive version of or like the uh, version of fibonacci this is what is happening so there is actually a very nice way to define this so let's do this mm. so if it's zero then it's zero right otherwise what we are going to do is we are going to apply this operation let's call that op actually we don't need to give it a name we can just copy this thing and put it inside a lambda and then we can start from 0 comma 1 and then we so this iteration of things will so let's actually do this so uh, i won't let this run because i don't want the infinite list but let's look at the first few elements of it so what is happening over here is this so if i wanted uh, the nth element i could take the nth element of this list and i could just um consider the second element of this pair so there is this function called second second what second does is basically it takes a pair of elements and it produces the second one i don't know if this is correct let's see Uh, yeah, looks correct to me. And we can actually apply this on a rather large number. Because this is just taking linear time. Anybody has any questions about this definition? Yes. Yes. So we can actually try to write the definition of iterate ourselves. Uh, I think that is a good exercise. So let's look at the type of iterate so i have a oh well let's copy that actually so i have some function f let's call that next actually and then i have some value c so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take c and put that in the front and i'm going to do uh Well, that doesn't look right. Uh, yeah, I should do. Right. So what iterate does is it basically like keep keeps on applying the function next again and again 
and uh, it does that but i am i am only use going to use the init element so that's fine this thing terminates mm. there is another interesting function called cycle so you can try to implement this yourself sometime like this it like cycles the list so we have 10 minutes i am going to start talking about folding so i hope you remember some of this from the previous lectures but if and if you don't that's fine so folding is basically if you have some kind of list actually let's do an example so uh, the folds are usually either right to the right or to the left and notice what it is telling us so ignore this t for now imagine that this is just a list so it's saying uh, this is the initial value and i have a list of things and i'm collapsing them to produce something so one example would be something like this will that work probably not because i have to produce the initial value so i can what how this thing looks like is why is it called fold r because it looks like that so these all these brackets are all these brackets are like that they are all associated to the right so actually i have a slightly better example where it, i can explain what uh, what this folder looks like so i want to start with a string let's call that string in it and i want to say use the numbers from 1 to 5 so now notice that this b over here this is a string but this list is a list of integers which is fine because it both of those things do not have to be the same type just that the when we uh, make this operation the operation must make sense so uh, the first element that we are taking in in this is going to be an int let's call that a and the second element is a string so let's call that s and i'm going to use this lambda so i'm going to uh, write it like that and so i'm putting this show over here what show does is it basically takes anything and produces a string so in this case like it will if it give you if it if you give it the number one it will give you the string one back and then i can do that And then I can put the string here because this string is just a string. So I took a number and a string and I produce a, produced a string, which is consistent with this type. And I can try to run that. Ah. So it is telling me this. So this shows that this, this is how fold R works. And the other way to do this would be fold L in which I would probably so notice fold R versus fold L in this it expects so yeah this should work let's see if I, if there are any type errors it should tell me there were no type errors these are just warnings so yeah this is the example of fold L so fold L looks like that. No wait. Oh, yeah. I mean, it is fold L, but I ended up doing the other thing anyways. I should. Well, your yeah, fold L is supposed to look like that as opposed to 
folder where the parents are to the right. Um, there is also so instead of having to supply this particular element every time, there is also folder one, which basically uses the assumes that this list is non empty and uses and starts using it from here. Um, I wanted to define, like show you the definitions of folder and folder, but we do have five minutes of time. So that's good. Any, any questions about this so far? Yeah. So show the type of folder and folder. Yeah. Fun fact. Fun fact that is called snock sometimes. Oh, snock, yeah, you're right. Snock is the name we would use for that. <laughs> so let's do this. So let's say that I want to do fold R. And I have the operation, the initial argument, and then I basically pattern match on the list. If the list is empty, then I put, I just output the initial element. If it is uh, non-empty, then what do we do? We basically use the operation and then right. So yeah, that makes sense. Um let me so I let's say I have fold R and um, I have a list consider this particular operation where given X and Y, I just return X. What is going to be the result of this computation? Yes. Yes. So it's just one because what it does over here is it just like it, this is, this X is one and it basically looks at this thing and it has the second thing and it, uh, tries to app, like the operation does not depend on whatever the second thing is. It just produces this. So, yeah. Okay. What is going to be the result of this? this applied on this infinite list. Same thing, right? One, because so the upshot is that folder is lazy, but, um, I guess as we will see in the next class, folder is not lazy, but then there are some other good things about folded. So I guess that is a topic for next class.
um, questions? Did anyone install stack? Okay, um, I guess sometime there will be an assignment. So. Um, oh, uh, don't forget to take your exams. Yeah. There's an operation, well, oh, always multiplication. And the first argument zero doesn't care what the second argument is, just returns zero. Right? Yes. And um, this actually points to a very important observation for me. There's something called parallel or. Anybody heard of it? If I parallel or such that it's going to return true if e is greater than two, what do I So, for example, for example, this is not parallel or because even if the second argument is an error, we just return like, but the first argument is true, the second argument is not evaluated. I'm going to stop recording if you don't mind. What? I'm going to stop recording. Yeah. Stop the recording. So I'm just throwing that in. I'm sort of giving you a glimpse of some of the things.